road long after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you as a dear, as a dear. We shall look at Ezekiel 22, verse 30. I'll read from the New International Version. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap, in the wall, so I wouldn't have to destroy the land. But I found no one. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1. Jeremiah 5 and verse 1. New King James Version. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know and seek in her open places if you can find a man. If there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Our God is a very strategic God. In everything he does, he is strategic. 
God is never casual in his operations. Very, very strategic. As you meander through these scriptures, you see God display his strategic nature. Nothing he does is casual. Everything he does is deliberate. Very deliberate. Very, very intentional. In our key text, Ezekiel 22 from verse 30, 23 to 31. Ezekiel 22, 23 to 31. The wickedness of the leaders of Israel, every strata of leadership, they were wicked people, very wicked. God was consciously disappointed in their wickedness. Their prophets were not left out. They were involved in conspiracy, false visions, and lies. The priests violated God's laws and profaned holy things. The princes, they shed innocent blood and made dishonest gain from the people they were supposed to protect. And the people themselves oppressed the poor and committed wanton robbery. And so when you look at those who were occupying leadership positions, they all did something that was nauseating to the nostrils of God. God was not happy. And no wonder he says, I looked around. The first part of the verse says, I looked. The next part says, I searched. I was looking for somebody who could help me. So that if that person stands to do the right thing, I will withdraw my action against them. And the situation today is not different. It's not much different from what we see in the days of Ezekiel. Our family lives have been brought to the fore in the past few weeks. The weakness of the fathers, the irresponsibility of the mothers, the juvenile tendencies of the children are very manifest. Many of us parents cannot even explain what is happening in our homes. Yet, God has raised us as leaders, fathers are leaders, mothers are leaders, and then we don't know what, how to manage our homes. The church is something else. A lot has been said here today. When we talk about failure in leadership, it affects every area of our lives. Many of us can't even lead ourselves. Not to talk of leading others. We cannot manage the situation and it's such a terrible thing. Earlier today, we heard that those we believe that we're Christians and we pray them into office, they are a gross disappointment. And please don't judge them too quickly because you and I help them to be a failure. Because if tomorrow you hear that I'm a commissioner of whatever, let's say commissioner of lands, all of you will come to my office and line up and believe this is our brother. He must give us a piece of land. Where will I get it from? And if I give you all the land, what about the others? I don't know if you understand. We are the ones that have helped those who are believers to do wicked things because they have to help us. Some years ago, somebody who was very close to me said, I don't ask for colleagues for any favor. I asked him why. He says, if you ask for a favor, the day they will come for you to return the favor, they will ask you to do wicked things you could not do. So he doesn't ask anybody. And so the failure of the brethren in politics or in high positions of leadership, many of us are contributing. The church will make demands. The fellowship will make demands. The brethren will make demands. Not to talk of family people. Haven't you passed a street in your village and you say, if this man was a real man, a real leader, this street, this street will have been tired or made good. God will help us in Jesus' name. All through the scriptures, we see incidences of God trying to search for men and women. He could give strategic responsibility concerning the kingdom of God. And God is very thorough and painstaking when it comes to searching for the adequate men and women. In Luke 15, we th see three examples of losses. Three examples. A lost sheep, verse 3 to 6. Somebody lost sheep. It is interesting to know that there were 100 fish and uh, sheep. And the man left 99 to look for one. If you do economic of scales, it doesn't make sense. You want to protect 91 and I leave, leave that one to stray. But the man was such a diligent leader in his own area and he chose to look for it. And by faith, he believed that the other 99 would remain intact until he found one. Search, 
He made a search and found it and threw a party according to the scriptures. Secondly, a woman lost a precious coin. Verse 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9, Luke 15. I understand that in those days when you get married, there is something you wear, about 10 coins on it. And if you lost anyone, it depreciated your person. And so if you didn't make effort to look for it, you will carry a shame all through your life. And so that woman had to search, put on lanterns under the bed everywhere to look for that which was lost. And so sometimes God is searching for you who is lost. And so the woman found it and also threw a party. Thirdly, from verse 11 to 32, a young man had presumptuously taken that which belonged to him, took it earlier than necessary, and left his father's house and covering. And the father kept looking for him. And many of us have wandered away from God in one way or the other. The greatest lesson in the story of what we call the prodigal son is that the young man left the covering of his father. But actually, the one in the house was a worse prodigal than the first one that left. Because when that one that was at home went hunting, looking for ordinary animal, and was constantly wishing that he could kill a little goat in the house and eat, he never knew that all that was left of his father was actually his own. In fact, his father was his own tenant. That's the reality of scripture because the man has shared and given the younger brother his share, what was lost, left was the other son's property. In which case, his father was a tenant in his son's house. But the son said, all this while I slaved for you, King James. I slaved for you, which means that his mentality was very wrong. That's the real prodigal son living in the house and never knew that he was a son. And when a slave came to invite him and say, hey, your brother is back. He said, whose brother? Which means while he was in the house, he was busy using whatever means to imagine what his brother was doing. This one that went into a wanton living and came back. So how do you say it's my brother? I was glad in verse 31, Luke 15, when the father came out and said, my son, comma, you have always been with me, comma, and all that I have is yours. These three things eluded this young man. He lost his leadership because he didn't understand who he was. And that everything the father had was his. So in his own house, he didn't understand he was the leader and he lost everything. May God help us in Jesus' name. God has a kingdom agenda. And he's waiting for you and I to help to solve this thing. And that's why he has created gates. We talk about gates of every human endeavor. And all of us fit into one or two or three gates, as the case may be. Can God depend on you? Can God depend on you in engineering? Can God depend on you in medicine? Can God depend on you in your family, in your father's house? Can God depend on you? It is not a mistake that God made you the first son or the last son or the middle son. It is not a mistake. There is a purpose. God is very strategic and he never makes mistakes. Hallelujah. I want us to quickly look at a few examples of how God raised or not raised, chose leaders. It was him that decided to make Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, they failed him before anybody could know what was happening. <clears throat> and God make, made efforts to cover their nakedness by killing an animal. He didn't say it killed an animal, but he said he covered them with the skin of an animal. And so I understand that he couldn't have covered them by leaving, getting the animal alive. And so animal had to be killed for his skin to come forth. And from then, God started making a plan on how to raise a leader. In trying to fulfill that plan, he raised leaders at each dispensation. Raising men and women he could use to continue the kingdom uh, project of God. And finally, we notice that even at a point when he was building the temple, he had to arrange a special leader, searched out Bezalel. And Bezalel and his friends were used to do special craft works. God is always looking out for people with special skills and abilities to use them for kingdom projects. I'm sure when he gave a vision to Moses, he was overwhelmed. How can these things be? He said, don't worry. I have chosen, I have chosen somebody with special grace and ability. 
and Bezalel, and he raised others to go with him. There are also men and women that God raised from the womb. While their mothers were pregnant for them, God was ready to use them. When you look at um, Exodus chapter 1, you see the power play of how the kings of Egypt was the Pharaoh wanted to punish them the more because he saw that their level of productivity was too high. And the Bible said the more he punished them, the more they became productive. He couldn't understand that biology. And so he now, the king now said, every woman that gives birth to a son, kill him. But God in his wisdom made sure that one spe two spectacular midwives were so excellent in their profession that when it came to the choice of a midwife, nobody could forget them because they were too special. I don't know if you understand. You know, some of us are so grudging in our work, this kind of work. They don't even pay us. Even some states, including mine, they don't pay staff. And so let us do it casually. You never understand that God has raised you as a leader for a time. And those two women feared God according to the scriptures. And they made sure that the purpose of God was fulfilled. By the way, every midwife and doctor is raised to preserve lives. But Pharaoh said he should destroy lives. But God used these women to stand for them. They may not be carrying any title, but they were there at the time of utmost need for the kingdom of God. And God was able to do what he wanted to do in the mighty name of Jesus. Jeremiah also, God raised him from the wind. He said, from the mother's womb, from your mother's womb, I called you. God continues to search for people. And when King Israel said, we wanted a king, God said, I don't want a king. They insisted. He gave them King Saul. And you realize that at the end of the day, King Saul had one primary problem that was playing to the gallery. He would only want to do something that would give him an accolade, open accolade. He didn't want casual one. You can understand when um, Samuel rebuked him and he told Samuel, no problem with the rebuke, but you see, I need to walk through with you so they will know that I'm still rubbing shoulders with the man of God. And Samuel said, no, I can't go with you. As Samuel took his first step out, he grabbed Samuel's gown and he tore. A prophecy followed it. That was the end of his ministry. God is always searching for leaders. And then he raised David, one little boy that was seemingly forgotten in the desert. But that boy, while in that place, he developed physical and soft skills and was able to learn things he couldn't learn at home. And he had a heart for God deep heart for God. And he was a man that was very quick to repent. When he was sent on an errand, when a man has been raised by God, a woman has been raised by God, opportunities come and you take care of them. Glory to God. And so David went to the war front as we reminded in the morning and God used him to deliver the people of Israel. Hallelujah. And for him it was not something big because for him he had equated the man of Philistine and the animals that he killed. And so killing him was not a big deal because he had seen something bigger before. God could trust him. No wonder in Acts of the Apostles chapter 10 from verse 38, sorry, Acts 13 verse 36, he said that David accomplished the purpose of God in his generation. God keeps searching for men. And the search for God, so to speak, ended with Jesus. Jesus Christ was the ultimate leader that God raised. And God raised him to be such that will make sure the purpose of God is totally carried out. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and power. And he went about doing what? Doing good. And we notice when we study the life of Jesus, we will see in clear terms unequivocal terms, we will see a sample of what leadership should be. Strong and effective leadership, what it should be in the mighty name of Jesus. I just want to say in summary, a leader knows where to go. A leader knows how to get there. And a leader has been there. Praise God. He knows where to go. He knows how to get there. He knows that he has been there. We're not calling leaders. God is not calling leaders who are theory, theorists. But he's calling leaders who are practical in what they do. Effective leaders will always inspire other people 
to ensure that that which is the purpose of God is what is achieved. Christian leadership expects that at the end of the day, whatever you do should bring glory to God and the purpose of the kingdom of God is established in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. When Pastor Bunge came, I was excited. Well, why was, what's the reason? Many years ago, my wife and I drove around Port Harcourt looking for a school for our last son, a secondary school. We were praying in the car, we were driving, we were just going around the whole town praying and looking for what? Schools. And there were many Christian schools and many regular schools. As soon as we drove into Pastor Bunge's school, I didn't know him then, there was peace in our hearts. We drove in there and met the principal who actually knew me, I didn't know her, and we settled down. Our, our son spent six years there. Six years of power and transformation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We see a situation where somebody understands that leadership transcends to everything that you do. Glory to God. Even in the school environment, he showed leadership and raised my son to understand the principles of leadership and spirituality. And I'm grateful for it. My son tells us that one day something happened in their class. I think somebody made a noise. You know how boys can behave. And it's a mixed school, boys and girls. And then uh, the principal came in. Who did this? They all kept quiet. The principal just looked at my son and said, Hallel, even you. My son said, Daddy, I felt that the ground should open so that I would disappear. And I swore that from that day, no more troubles. Hallelujah. Because he created a school with a foundation for righteousness and for leadership. May God give us understanding in the mighty name of Jesus. A leader should say what he knows that God has asked him to do and he should plan it and he should thirdly do it. You say, you plan, and you do. You say, you plan, and you do. Having heard from God, you should be able to declare what God says you should do and you should do it. And you should plan it and as well as do it in the mighty name of Jesus. When people see you, they will know that this man knows what he is doing. 28 years ago, I was appointed the general manager of Fugosu Businessmen's Fellowship in Nigeria. I came with a degree in microbiology and chemistry. I never did any administration. I have a second degree in technical education. And I had an experience of teaching in a polytechnic. But somehow, in the course of my work in the polytechnic, I was appointed a head of department above my peers. I didn't know what God was doing, and I did that job as head of department for four years. That gave me a little understanding of the dynamics of leadership and dynamics of politics in boardrooms. I understood it a little. I didn't know God was training me. My colleagues would not come to school any day. They don't have lectures, but I chose to go because I knew that my position as a lecturer was critical for the kingdom agenda that God had for me. Because while in youth service, I now knew that God had called me to be a teacher. Many of you are ashamed to be teachers, and I decided to be a teacher. So I went back to school and picked up a postgraduate diploma in education. And I love teaching till tomorrow. And I'm proud to say I'm a certified teacher. Glory to God. Some of you who read education are running as far as God has land. Because you feel that there is no name and prestige in it. I am a teacher any day. In fact, my calling and training has helped me to understand the scriptures better. So as I walked in that place, I didn't know God was training me. One particular experience. You know, polytechnics will always have committees upon committees. And so they put me in committees. I didn't know how to write reports. This old Ghanaian barrister taught me how to write reports, taught me how to do minutes and all that, and I learned. To the extent that usually in every committee, you have somebody from the registry who will be the, uh, the recorder or secretary. And they will ask me, ah, Bruno, help me now. I will help them. I didn't know I was sharpening skills for my position in full gospel. And so when I joined full gospel as a general manager, it was a Herculean task. Managing the affairs of the fellowship in the whole country and extending their tentacles beyond Nigeria. But God helped me. I realized that all these experiences I gained had become very, very helpful. One thing that happened, when I came in, I realized I didn't know anything about accounting. 
So I decided to learn accounting through the window. Because I realized that if I don't understand the accounting, I will not understand the reports they bring to me. And these are chartered accountants that will bring reports. Me that didn't go to school for accounting have to read, understand, and present. So I went to study. That is part of leadership. Whatever you are doing now may seem mundane, irrelevant. But God is preparing you for something more responsive in the mighty name of Jesus. While being raised up in the scripture, you know, we were taught to say the truth and be honest. And that position exposed me severally to situations where honesty and truth is required. And God helped me. Hallelujah. Somebody sees you and says, ah, I made a pledge to the fellowship. Take the money. Weekend, 300,000, 600,000. I'll carry it in my boot and I'll get to my, tell my wife I'm coming. I'll tell my wife I'm coming. I'll rush to the office and put it in the safe. And sometimes we'll carry money and travel. And this Jehovah delivered his servant one day. We went to Makodi for a convention. We had finished, paid all the money we had by Friday into the bank. And then the ones we collected Friday evening and Saturday, we had them in the vehicle. Sunday, we were going back. Somewhere around Angpa, a vehicle double-crossed us. They were armed robbers. They took us into the bush. We all left flat. And they ransacked the entire vehicle, took everything they wanted to take, shoes that were in front were found at the back, those went, laptops, everything went, including my phones. And then we got back to the car. And the accountant was telling me, Oh, God, what about the money? What about the money? I said, Check now. He was sitting, the seat behind the driver in a bus. And he kept the money in between his two legs. And bought oranges just after Makodi and placed on top of the waterproof. And the waterproof was sitting there. The oranges were sitting on top of it. But those four boys ransacked the entire vehicle. They left that money. Cash was above one million. Check was almost two million naira. They left them. I could only see that this is God's hand at work. Glory to God. So, God prepares you through all that you are going through. Because there is a strategic leadership responsibility that God is calling you to in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I, I quickly try to check out scriptures to know how in the search for leadership, how did God get leaders? And I noticed that in Acts chapter 1, 15 to 26, Acts chapter 1, 15 to 26, the new church after Jesus had been, had been taken, wanted to replace Judas Iscariot. What did they do? They prayed and they cast lot. Matthias came up. Theologians believe that that election was wrong. What was their reason? They said, as soon as this scripture ended, everything about Matthias ended. They seemed to believe that Paul was the real replacement for Judas, but that's for another day. It's not a headache here. But the point I'm making is that people used prayers and lot, casting of lots to choose leaders. In Acts chapter 6, 1 to 7, people were complaining about the welfare, their welfare and sharing of food, particularly for widows. And so the leader said, we cannot leave the word of God and prayer to go and serve bread, serve tables. So they said they should choose some people. And I want us to notice some things from that scripture. The Choosing of these people were participatory. They said, choose some people among us. And they clearly defined the eligibility and the qualifications so required. And three things or two. They said there must be men full of faith, number one. Full of the Holy Ghost, number two. And full of wisdom. It was very clear. When you are doing elections in your church or ministry... Are you sure that you have defined what you want? I get excited each time you look at uh, Guardian newspapers, Tuesdays and Thursdays, they always adverse. Go and take time and look at them. They are very conscious to delineate exactly what they want. Granted, these days, whatever you write there, some people don't even read, they will put up the applications. You say, I want OND, they will put PhD for you. Or they will withdraw the PhD and put only the OND. When they come in and see what you are paying those with degrees, first and second degree, they will come and remind you, sir, I have a PhD. But you applied for a job for OND. 
Hallelujah. We saw them doing this and at the end they laid hands on them and prayed for them. Acts chapter 9 verse 15 the Bible says that God chose Saul as a vessel of his. He told Ananias, go for he's a chosen vessel of mine. God chose him. And in Acts chapter 13, 1 to 3, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. God has his own way of choosing his people. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. I hope you notice at the beginning it was Barnabas and Saul. Subsequently it flipped around. It became Saul and Barnabas. And Barnabas didn't take offense. Hallelujah. Barnabas didn't take offense because he was sure that God was working out something. And sometime in 1 Kings chapter 19 16 to 21 Prophet Elijah was directed by God to go and anoint three men. And these three men were so strategic, if number one misses some, a target, number two must catch the target. If somehow that target eludes number two, number three must catch him. He anointed Hazel king over Aram, Jehu king over Israel, and Elisha to succeed Elijah. I don't know if you were in Elijah's position that God will send you to go and anoint somebody who will replace you. It's not a funny experience. Hallelujah. And it's not an easy one, but he did that. All I'm trying to say is that God, in trying to choose his leaders, he is very, very strategic and very, very careful. Recently, I was trying to wonder the difference between Peter and Paul and their ministry. And God said that he was raising Paul to be a minister to the Gentiles and quarantined Peter to the ministry of who? The Jews. And I say, looking at the pedigree of the two, and you will see there's a wide chasm between them. He needed an educated and erudite lawyer, an experienced man that had all the necessary visas around the world to be a man that would tackle the Gentiles with all their wisdom and knowledge. I hope you understand. But he needed Peter, who was a raw, crude Jew, to tackle those Jews. God is very, very strategic. And so when God is doing something with you, don't think that he's stupid. He's not. We need to quickly look at a few things that God is looking for in strong and effective leaders. What is God looking for? Number one, he wants to use servant leaders. Servant leaders. Servant leaders are not bosses. But they are what? Servants. Matthew 20. 26 to 28. Matthew 20, 26 to 28. God is looking for servant leaders. It looks like a contradiction. Servant and leader at the same time. That's the kind of people that God is looking for. It is in serving God that God lifts you up. When you serve as a servant leader, God will lift you up. And for you to effectively be a servant leader, you must know your identity in Christ. God owns me. I don't own myself. Hallelujah. When I served as a general manager of Full Gospel, I was conscious of the fact that I was a staff and I was a servant. Very conscious of it. And I made up my mind that anything that will uplift the goals and aspirations and visions of the fellowship, I would do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If it meant to serve people, I will serve them. Because I've come to know it is in service that God gives you promotion. I had to learn to understand people and the dynamics of human psychology. I had to understand them. I even had to understand the dynamics of meetings. You know, in meetings, it is not the chairman that could be the leader. The real leader may be sitting down there quiet. I know one of our men, very brilliant man. He will sit down there in the council meeting or executive meeting, just doing as if he's not listening. And suddenly he will say, Mr. President. He will raise his hands. And then he will analyze everything everybody has said, bring them together the same way that uh, Moses' rod caused the river to come back. Then after putting it together, he will do an analysis and say, Mr. President, I think this is the way we should go. And then the man will say, what do we say? 
Yes. I don't know if you understand. And for me, that is the real leader of the group. He doesn't make too much noise. He doesn't have special position. But the man has wisdom and understanding. Mr. President, I feel that the Spirit is leading us to do it this way, if it's okay by you. He's still submitting to the leader. Yes, saying the Spirit of God says. I don't know if you understand. But some of us will say, if the Spirit of God told me and you refuse to do it, then I won't go with you. Praise Master Jesus. This knowledge of a servant leader gives you security in the face of service. Many of us believe that if I decide to be a servant leader, I will become insecure. They will not recognize me as a leader. Praise Master Jesus. Hallelujah. We must be sure that we are not insecure. When we serve with all our heart, we have nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. When you serve as a servant leader, you have nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to hide. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The second issue was dealt to a large extent by a brother, integrity and character. God is looking for people he could trust. Let me ask you, some of our leaders here, can somebody send his daughter to your house to serve the youth call? I will not get pregnant before she before one year. No, I'm asking a sincere question. Praise Master Jesus. Can somebody trust you enough and say your character is above board? I can leave my son for you and you make sure he maintains his faith in Christ. These are critical questions. We've heard stories of somebody who sent his daughter to a friend's house and the girl became pregnant. The parents were too ashamed to ask her to come back. She went for youth care service and got pregnant for his friend. You can imagine the friend is the father's contemporary and the daughter of this man has been put to the family way. May God help us in Jesus' name. Leaders are judged by their character. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 1 what Jesus began to do and to teach. Acts 1 1. He says, oh Theophilus, I'm writing to you concerning the things that Jesus began to do and teach. Our character is very critical. We may have charisma, but your charisma, if it is not matched with character, is a waste. Hallelujah. Character and integrity is the moral force behind leadership. If you don't have character, your leadership will be questioned. Glory to God. You know, as a leader, I had to learn to make those I'm leading to know that I'm open concerning the things I do. But many of us are so secretive and hoarding information and things, thinking that that is what makes you the big man. Praise God. Let's be open and trust God to help us in the mighty name of Jesus. In Psalm number 78, stanza 70 to 72. We learn that we must have integrity of hearts and we must have skills. You should have appropriate skills, honed skills. You must also have the integrity of heart. The two must be combined. Bible said that David had a heart after God and yet David had the skills. Many of us have skills and we don't have character. Our hands are good, but our hearts are not right. May God help us in Jesus' name. Dr. John Maxwell says concerning David, that David had mastered the three Ps. What are the three Ps in every organization or church? Planning, preparation, and personnel. Planning, preparation, and personnel. You get to a point, you realize that David had a powerful organization. He arranged people and he did what he needed to do with them. Praise God. Number three is self-discipline. These are particular characteristics we see in Jesus, which every strong and effective leader must have. Self-discipline. Leaders must deal with self first before they can serve. John chapter 13, 3 to 17. 
deal with self first. We must exhibit the fundamental quality of self-discipline if we must succeed as leaders. Everything you do must not be in your own interest. The Nigerian leadership is always doing things that are beneficial to their personal selfish interest first. But a good leader, a good Christian leader, should do that which will be of interest to his or her family and to the generation that God has called, it, called us into. We must carefully consider the possible consequences of our action. Possible consequences of our action. I realize as our children were growing up that we got to a point we had teenagers and we had small ones. And I realized that I wouldn't deal with each of them the same way. I, I wouldn't deal, deal with them as a group. I had to divide them. If I wanted to talk to the bigger ones, I had a meeting with them separately. The smaller ones don't have to be there. I don't know if you understand. So but some of us would treat all of them as a bunch. And you start raising anger in their spirit. May God help us in Jesus' name. Self-discipline involves controlling any natural tendencies to act out of anger, greed, or selfishness. We noticed our second son was easily angry. And when he gets angry, tornado will be released. It was a big concern to my wife and I. And I hope parents here who are leading their families are careful to understand their children. Very careful. It was a big concern to us. So he went to secondary school by the leading of God to a particular school. By the time the boy came back after first term, I saw that the anger was gone. I was wondering what happened. But you know, one day the school called me and said, we'd like you to come to our school on Sunday. Ah, my heart sank. I said, whether my son has had issues with his anger again. They said, daddy, just come. And I went and the boy won an award as the best actor in school. I was very proud and happy. But you see, God, because of the background of that institution, had dealt with the issue of anger in his life. Let's be strategic. Even the schools your children will go to, be prayerful and strategic about it. Because God will deal on certain issues in their lives. They don't all have to go to the same school. But for each child, prayerfully direct. And God will lead you in the mighty name of Jesus. At a point, each time we gather around the television as a family, because that's when we talk, that young man will enter the room and stay. Ah, one day my wife was concerned. Sent one of them to go and do Reiki. To go and find out what the boy was doing. He was actually studying his lines as an actor. He was studying his lines because he was going to do a play in school. So he was memorizing his lines. We say, okay, you should have told us now. We're wondering why you always leave everybody here. And today is an actor. Praise Jesus. Number four, trustworthiness. Can you be trusted as a husband? Can you be trusted as a wife? Bible says in Romans 12, present what is honest before men. It is first of all the responsibility of every Christian leader to present what is what? Honest. Igbo people will say, when you shake hand beyond the elbow, you know what you are looking for. I don't know if you understand. As a leader, you must do things that are very clearly open. Nobody has room for a second guess of what you did. That is why sometimes we do official letters. Next paragraph, after saying what we have said, we say, for the avoidance of doubt. Permit me to repeat and explain those. One, two, three. I don't know if you understand. Because you want to be unequivocal. Nobody should doubt what you have said. We should present what is honest before others. Simple little things you need to do. When I was a lecturer, I understood the nature of students I had. So the office door was always open. My colleagues would lock their doors always. Mine was always open. Because I didn't want all the students to know what the others do. And so I must not be taught to be in the same group. So my door was what? Wide open. Even as general manager of Full Gospel, if a woman visits and you stayed a little longer than I think, I'll call my secretary in. Not for anything, for her to see the positions and maybe is drop on what we're discussing. Madam, please come. And then I'll give her one careless message. She goes out. If the person stays more, I ask her to come back again. I don't know if you understand. 
what am I trying to do? Presenting what is what? Honest before men. And so if you go and say, my God does this, they'll say, now lie, or God no, they do. Me, I did there. Am I making sense to you? You'll be doing pru, 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 doing things that are not corner, corner, and they bring money. You say whether it is yours or not. You're not too sure. One of my friends that runs a ministry, if you send money to him, he say, please, bro, define it. Is it my personal money or is it money for my family or for, my, for the ministry? You must define it. I don't know if you understand. Let's keep records straight. Can God trust you? Can people trust you? Can you be trusted in your office? One of my friends in our fellowship was made a permanent secretary in River State. One day he went into his office. He saw white powder everywhere. And the cleaner of the office was following him with trepidation in her heart. And the man said, what is this? He just raised his hand, said prayers, and asked the woman to come and clean. She started confessing. Oga, they gave me small money. They told me to come and pour this thing at night. She left her house midnight to pour the juju powder in the office. <laughs> the man prayed. She cleaned it and he sat down and did his work. So you realize that those you work with are mobile altars. Are you understanding me? And so as a leader, you must be so strong with God and you can be trusted by God to occupy that position. Praise Master Jesus. And the, Number five is communication. Interpersonal skills are a must for every effective leader. When you watch the way Jesus communicated with people, it was powerful. Everything he said, it was very, very clear and it was unambiguous. He was very, very clear in his communication. One day I was complaining about my accountant. I said, why? I don't know why she doesn't do what I asked her to do. And the national treasurer asked me a question. Are you sure she heard you well? If she heard you, are you sure she understood you? I say, I see. There are certain critical communication you need to repeat. And sometimes you ask the person to say what you have said just to be sure that you communicated properly. And we must improve our productivity if we have good communication in whatever we do. Even in our families. You tell a child, do one, two, three, four. And you know very well in your heart that by the age and by that child's capacity, he cannot understand the four. You tell him to do them. And then you come back and you are quarreling. You should understand what a child can do. And sometimes I'm leaving, I have to write, you come. You do one, two, three, four. If you have any issues, call me. It looks too academic, but it's helpful. Communication is very, very critical. It is important that leaders share information concisely and efficiently. It helps your organization and even your family in whatever we do. We should learn to be good listeners. Jesus listened very well. We must be very, very good listeners. And the Lord will help us to do this in Jesus' name. Teamwork. Your ability to be a team player is a valuable leadership quality. When we are looking for new staff, we are looking for people who have ability to work as a team. These days, we are no longer looking at what you can do alone. We are looking at what you can do as a team. Our family should be raised as a team. And by the way, you should remember that every husband and wife should be a team, a formidable team before the children. Otherwise, they will arrange you and your wife at, against each other. The children are very good at that. They know, okay, daddy is coming back or going out. Daddy buys sweet. Daddy comes back with that sweet. They have noted that daddy does not buy sweet. He, has, he had promised to, he never explained. And then another time, you are just coming back, they run out, daddy, daddy, welcome, daddy, daddy, welcome. I want to eat biscuit. And the daddy who is very tired and famished will come in and say, give them biscuit. Mommy has said no biscuit because dinner was almost ready. Do you understand? But because daddy was not wise enough, they have played madam against Oga. Smart children. But if the man understands, he will say, come here. Did you ask mommy for biscuit? The face will go down. You know he's guilty. Do you understand? 
And then you give him a spank. Next time he won't try that joke. Because parents will bring the head of children will bring the head of the father, bring the head of their mother and jam them. Because two of you are not playing from one point. May God help us in Jesus' name. Teamwork is very, very critical. And we must try to be sure that our respective skills are honed. We must be good at what we do. That is why when I was a teacher, I noticed that students who form discussion groups, if you join a discussion group and you don't study, it's a terrible mess. If you join any discussion group, you must study very well. Otherwise, you come there, you look at number one, he's talking very well. Look at number two, you are depressed. Look at number three, you don't do anything. You say, Chai, I'm going to write the exam tomorrow with these people. I'm finished though. You have already failed. But when you prepare very well, you come ready to deliver, they will deliver, all of you will learn in Jesus' name. Teamwork is critical. But let me say, there are those who dodge responsibility. But by reason of the assignment of the team, you want to be sure the work is done. But you know tomorrow, those who dodge responsibility, they are the ones that will lose. They will start looking for you to solve the problem they refuse to learn at the appropriate time. One other issue as leaders who must look at is conflict management. Jesus says offense will come. We are not shielded from offense. There is no buffer for offense around us. And certain conflicts are clearly unavoidable in organizations. In Acts chapter 6 from verse 1 to 7 where we read, the conflict was in sharing of food amongst widows. They started complaining. In Acts chapter 15, 1 to 5, the conflict was being Jews and performing um, circumcision. And then we see in Acts 15, 36 to 41, Acts 15, 36 to 41, we see a very major issue between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. Paul felt that John Mark was grossly responsible comes late to meetings, never carries out assignments, and says, I cannot take such a dollar with me in my team. But the Bible says that Barnabas, who was his son of encouragement, saw things inside John Mark that he could excavate with time. So what did he do? He took John Mark out, and Paul took another person, and he went and cooked, so to speak, John Mark for about two years, returned him to the same Paul, and Paul accepted in his ministry. Can you see how they maturely managed a conflict situation? That may have been the end of Paul and Barnabas, but they were able to manage this, and God will help us in Jesus' name. In the morning, a barrister told us how Abraham, and how, how Abraham managed the conflict between his headers and the headers of Lot. Effective leaders know how to manage and reduce conflict in order to preserve a pleasant and productive environment. When you work in an office, keep your ears down. Are you hearing me? Put your ears down in the office, otherwise one day you'll be lost. You just come, big man, keep your nose up. Me, I keep my ears down. Because I have a critical assignment from God I must carry out. One of the first things you do when there is conflict is cooperation. In any group project, seek for cooperation. Again, you must also whip up the issue of negotiation and compromise and tact. Negotiation, compromise, and tact. There are valuable school skills where you have conflict management. I had a staff who was a thief, but I didn't catch him. One day, I caught him. But I didn't catch him directly, so I couldn't accuse him, but I had all my issues well kept. You know, sometimes when you are too ejaculatory, you, you, you spoil matters. So I kept quiet, and I followed it gradually, procedurally. I followed the process. But as I said, we should follow process in the morning. I followed the process. When the man saw that I had roped him very well, and I was ready for the kill, he came and tendered his resignation. Resignation. Ah! And he did it in January. 
And in full gospel, we had a major meeting second or third weekend in every January of the year. And that meeting was critical. My office was to give an annual report for all that we did, including accounts. And this man had the password. He knew everything in accounts. He had them. Ah, I had to do negotiation. I said, oh boy, come, 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 come. You know, me and you are friends. He said, yes. I said, I need you to help me. Can I hire you for one week? He gladly obliged. Because I quickly hired another lady. And I said, look, I'm hiring you to teach this lady everything. Meanwhile, before then, I had gone and copied everything from his system and kept safe. I don't know if you understand. I did that. And then I negotiated with him, hired him for one week, pleaded with him. I made him see, do, I made him see that he was doing a very big service and favor to me. He trained that lady for one week. And the lady was smart. She learned the work. That's how I released him. One day after some months, he came back and fell flat in my office. He said, Oga, you must forgive me. I said, I didn't want to ask, what did you do? I laid hands on him and prayed for him and released him to go. Am I making sense to you? I had, that was a terrible situation for me. There was no way I could send that lady anywhere. The meeting was just at my nose. But I needed to get things done. The other thing we must do is we must learn how to solve problems. Leaders must use their creativity and practical experience to solve problems. They will always arise. In 2 Kings chapter 6, 1-7, the sons of the prophets knew that the accommodation was too tight for them. They went to obtain permission from the prophet. And uh, when they went to cut the wood, they asked the prophet to accompany them. Maybe if the man was there, faith will arise and they will do a better job. You know the rest of the story. In leadership, in leadership, anytime you notice an issue, don't just come and say, ah, the food we have is not enough. Bring a solution along. That's a good leader. Am I making sense to you? When there is an issue, come with the issue and come with an attendant solution to the issue and present to the main leader. These days, anybody who is always coming with complaints and issues is not a good leader. Bring issues and bring solutions along with them. Finally, in Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20, every good leader must be committed to the Great Commission. One thing that sets you apart as a good Christian leader is that you are committed to the go and to the make. Jesus says, go and bring souls in and do what? Make them what? Disciples. Every believer, wherever you are, that is the greatest kingdom vision that God is giving every leader. No matter how small the place is, God is calling you to be a leader to ensure that the Great Commission is established. Anywhere we are, if we don't win souls, we are wasting time. I started my career as a teacher in an all-boys Roman Catholic institution. And I was praying, God, what do I do in this place? I kept praying, God, what do I do? I didn't know how to teach. I never studied education. I had to learn how to write note lesson notes. Ah. I prayed and prayed. I learned to ask questions. I learned how to write certain um, lesson notes. By the time I had spent six months as a youth core member in that school, they made me head of the Department of Science. Far and above some white people from Ireland. Why? I committed my life to that work. And I committed to teaching my students passionately. They knew it. And I said, these boys must do well, not by cheating, but by correct work. I spent time with them. I was single, so I had all the time. Now they made me timetable teacher. So I shifted all my practicals to the afternoon and had more time to teach. And then in the afternoon, I do my practicals. And my students were doing well. In the course of all that, I was witnessing Christ to them. In the streets, in the college, I witnessed Christ. They come to my house, I witnessed Christ. And so one day my wife and I went to Goni. And uh, one young man had called us who had been a student with us. He was a police officer. And he came to the police college around Norma. We went to, I felt so proud that day because we led him to Christ. And we followed him up. Because wherever God posts you as a leader, 
He has called you to win souls and to make disciples. Let us pray. I don't know what God has asked you to do for him as a Christian leader. Are you the head of a ministry? Or are you an associate or deputy assistant pastor? Are you working as an engineer doing construction in the site? Are you an architect? Are you there for Jesus? Are you leading as a servant leader? You are the head of a fellowship, choir master or mistress, Bible study leader, Sunday school leader. Whatever position you occupy this evening, God desires that you be a strong and an effective leader. I must say that we must learn to pray. We must learn to pray as leaders. One thing that helped me was we were always praying. And sometimes God will wake me up and tell me things to do. You must hear God speak. That is the hallmark of your leadership. God will tell you what to do. And when you come into the office or the environment where God has called you, you start doing things that look strange because God has spoken to you. And the Lord will do things through you in the mighty name of Jesus. I'd like you to rise up and let us pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, thou art welcome in this place. Just raise your hands and ask the Lord. You are welcoming him. Lord, purge me afresh. Fill me afresh. Get me to understand that which you are calling me to do and that which you've called me to do. Open my eyes to fully understand the kingdom assignment you are calling me into that I might pay attention to it. Your assignment may not, may not be the same like others. Paul says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. You may not do everything others are doing in ministry because there is a peculiarity in your assignment. All things are lawful. But not all things are expedient. Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Help me to do this assignment as unto you. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Please put your hands together for Elder Ono oh, 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 no. Can you do it better? This is a very wonderful session. I don't play with teachings on leadership. And I know you've received something from the Lord. Can we quickly stretch forth our hands and pray for added grace? Let's ask the Lord to refill him. Let's pray that the Lord will empower and prepare him deeper, fuller, and greater for the next assignment. And let's begin to ask for the Lord to bring him into the season of his harvest. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Men and women of God, I want to hear you pray. And then when you are done praying for him, can you return your hand to yourself and say, Lord, I will manifest and demonstrate all that I have received tonight as a leader in my own sphere of influence. I receive the power, the grace to demonstrate, manifest, and fulfill my mandate as a leader. Lord, we give you praise for you are worthy. Thank you for the impartation that you've given us tonight. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Let your amen be louder. Let it be clearer. Uh, can you just um, help someone by your side and ask him, how was it? Amen. All right, God bless you. Please be seated. All right, it's time to uh, give to God.
it's time to honor God with our offerings and our sacrifices. And the one to lead us tonight is no other person than Apostle Raph. I call him Dominion. Please put your hands together as he comes. Please put those hands together for Jesus. I know that you can do better than that. Come on, give honor to whom honor is due. Let's celebrate our master. Yeah, it's okay to stand if you want to. He is the king of kings and the lord of lords. The Alpha, the Omega, the Prince of Peace. Ageless, tireless, worryless God. The one that never fails. The one that by covenant assures that your harvest is always sure. Can somebody say a good amen? Praise the Lord. Please, you may be seated. Turn with me to John chapter 3 and verse number 16. The book of John chapter 3. Praise God. Hallelujah. Are we all there? Amen. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Can somebody who is awake and alive say a good amen? Praise the Lord. I want to read to us from the Amplified Translation. And he said, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son. I I'll stop there. Amen. God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he was willing to give up his only begotten and unique son. Friends, the time of offering is a very critical and important time in any service. Praise the Lord. And it's not the time to be treated with levity, carelessly. You know, let it just come and pass so that the service can continue. No. The time of giving is important and is crucial in every service because of its product. Glory to God. You can give without loving. You can give without loving. But you can't love and not give. Lovers are givers. You cannot tell God that you love him and nothing comes out of you to him. You know, many years ago, I was in the office with one of my friends and you know, somebody brought some things to be bought and all that ladies wears. And I was pretending as if I wasn't seeing it. 
So my friend now told me, I love my wife. No before mouth. <laughs> Praise God. If you love your wife, material day here, buy for her. <laughs> so out of you know. <laughs> How am I going to do? <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> I had to prove <laughs> that I love my wife. Praise the Lord. Every man's giving is according to the depth and the weight of his loving. What you give it means how greatly you love God and how dearly you are prized him. One day, God woke up Abraham and said, Take thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest, to so -so mountain where we show you and sacrifice him. And because Abraham was a lover of Jehovah, he did not consult with Sarah because if he did, it won't work. So he left to obey the God he loved. And God commended him and say, now I know that thou fearest God. But in the context which I'm speaking, we should say, now I know that you love me. You can give me whatever I ask. How much you love, it means how much you release. And you know, many times when we give, we believe that, you know, God is taking for all, from us because he needs money. But God does not have a need for money. He is rich. He is Jehovah El Shaddai. Can somebody say amen? What you give does not move God. It only moves you to where you are properly positioned to receive what is your due in this season. So your giving repositions you to where you should be. And the weight of it determines the acceleration of the movement. God told me this evening that whatever you give in relationship to how much you love him, he is going to move on it and bring you a massive harvest. If you are saying amen, say it with faith. That amen is asleep. Can you say a better amen? So please, can we be on our feet as we give? According to the size of your love. Okay. On the screen. Okay. Praise the Lord. The account number will be on the screen. Praise the Lord. So if you don't have cash, you can make a transfer or you go to the back behind the, 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 the altar there, this thing there, and then do a POS. This is modern times. Amen. There's no excuse to give. Lift up what you have. Father, we thank you. Open your mouth and speak forth. Declare what you want. God has a promise on what you are having in your hand. He said he's going to move on it and bring you a harvest. He 
will move on it and bring you an harvest. So go ahead and speak to him. Go ahead and speak to him. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everyone who is giving according to the size of their love for you. Let there be a hastening. Let there be a quickening of the harvest of the seed sown in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. If you are receiving your own harvest, can your amen confirm it? Yes. How many of you know that we are a chosen generation? Hallelujah. Mighty men, can you rise up on your feet? You are a chosen generation. Hey.